Douglas Group is a firm which sells companies. That's all we do. We represent sellers, 100%. Um, the objective of sellers in the medical device space is a little bit special relative to other sellers in the world. I would say medical device owners want one plus one is 10. Other people want one plus one is three, five maybe. But the medical device holder, uh, owners really want a um, much more aggressive stance. Um, most of the medical <laughs> device owners who come to us come to us uh, a little ahead of time, before their company is really ripe, before it's really ready for sale. Um, but some, some not. Um, let me get a little feel for this audience, if I could. How many people in this room own all or part of a medical device company of your own? OK. Um, how many people here work for a medical device company? That's a bigger part of the population. The other thing I, I hear a lot of as I talk to people are service providers to medical device companies. How many people own a service provider? OK, and how many people work for a service provider? Okay, so it looks like that's maybe half of, half of this group, something like that. Um, we sell companies, we've been doing it for a little over 25 years. We've sold 130 companies. Um, most of those weren't medical device companies. For the first 10 or 15 years, we focused pretty much entirely on manufacturers, plastic manufacturers and metal manufacturers for the most part. Only in recent years have really, we really gotten kind of excited about this segment. And it really is kind of a, an interesting segment. Um, I, I'm a big believer in what we do. I think it's really kind of a good thing. I grew up with a guy who came from communist Russia way back when, so they need. <laughs> and he had a, an expression. He said, free enterprise is shameless exploitation for the common good. <laughs> and I like that. <laughs> um, I have always believed in that instead of being there for business people, making a really big difference in the, in the marketplace. I, my daughter, eldest daughter, was home from Cornell recently with a bunch of friends, and they were all talking, and I couldn't help myself. I kept throwing in little comments. And finally, my daughter stopped the whole conversation, and she said, you have to understand my mom. She thinks there's some kind of healthy selfishness that's really good for the world. <laughs> and I do. I, I think that's true. Um, when you talk about the medical device space, too many of the people that come to us come a little bit too early. They come before their technical approvals are quite in place, and that's really hard to do. You really can't make it work that way. Uh, the FDA currently regulates 190,000 medical devices in the US. And of those devices, they're made by some 18,000 different companies in the US. It's a big group. It's a big population. Uh, and businesses have to deal with really complex rules in this uh, space. How many people here get involved with helping owners get technical approval? A pretty good number. <laughs> it's a pretty good number of the mix. Um, I think it's very critical, and it's really important to the process. And we try to wait until we get there. Um, some owners come to us before. They're quite ready. Um, that's fine. We can deal with that sometimes, but we can't deal with it too far in advance, or it's just not going to work. It's going to hurt value so much. Or the other thing that happens to business owners is that uh, they come before they've gotten the final approval, and then the investors who come in behind them, they don't want to buy the company. They want to reimburse you for a part of your cost and get a majority ownership for doing that. And that's not where most business owners want to be. It doesn't work too well. Um, when we talk about uh, the Saleability Foundation, we really talk about trying to wait until initial sales, uh, technical approvals are in place. Some initial sales have happened. That does not have to be huge. We've sold a lot of companies that literally multiplied by 10 in, within a couple of years of acquisition. We have to have the technical approvals in place, and we have to have the initial sales at least well begun. Um, we sold a company not too long ago. This is about three years ago. And the company was smaller than our average. Most of our companies are 10 million to 100 million. In sales. This one was about seven million, so it was kind of youngish, relatively. Had great profitability, and frankly, we had to create a lot of competition to get the pricing right for that company. We ended up with about 20 offers, less than 10 million dollars. It was frustrating. It was hard to do, but we had two offers north of 30 million dollars. So we closed it for 32 million, and everybody was happy. 
worked out well. You don't always know that that's going to happen. Um, you have to be able to show some production beginnings, not very far along, but you have to at least sh have, have good estimates of what the production costs are going to be. We have a lot of clients that we've dealt with in the very early phases where in their first production runs, costs were 70% of sales. That's tough and that's hard to deal with, but if you can show that as soon as that sales volume ratchets up, those costs are going to go way down, it helps a lot. We see a lot of companies that start at 70% of sales and end at 20% or 25%. And buyers can see that. Buyers are aware, are aware that that might happen. So current positioning of sales, profitability expectations, measurement of those going forward, um, the solidity of future sales estimates, do you have good demographic information on where your sales are going to go? Um, I think of Andy May and the balance testing stuff. Um, that's a great spot. I mean, it really is. You know the demographics are going to increase like crazy. I'm not sure how you protect it. I'm not sure wh what you can patent or otherwise protect to make it absolutely secure. And you want to be in front of everybody else. So far you are. <laughs> so that's good. But I think that'll be a beautiful place for a medical device success. It's going to go well. A lot of medical device companies have started off tiny. Medtronics was two guys working out of a garage in 1949. Now they're $30 billion. That's amazing. Cook Medical. I just learned that they just started in 1953. <laughs> 60. <I'm sorry. laughs> Thanks. <clears throat> but they're over $2 billion now. I mean, that's been a magnificent start from a very early on time. Uh, there's a business author I like. It's Michael Gerber. He wrote Emith. Some of you probably have read his stuff way back when. Michael's a friend of mine, and I like when he when he talks about his business. He says every business owner wants to sell a business. They all do. He said if they can't sell a business, they don't own a business. They own a job. <laughs> there's truth in that. You really want to create that value. And when the time comes, uh, what I would like to talk about here is just a few little tips about how you go at that when it's time to sell the company. Um, it's a tough process, and the competitors are unruly, and it becomes difficult. It's kind of like a police effort to hold back <laughs> the competitors. It becomes really rough sometimes. And finding the right competition is hard. It's very important, too. Um, we probably spend the first two months doing two things. One is figuring out who the competitors are going to be, who's going to be interested in the company. and to do that, we talk to a wide array of buyers. We will talk to many different kinds of buyers and we'll ask them, what's your primary target as you make acquisitions today? We'll ask them, what did you buy lately? We'll ask them, what did you pay for what you bought? We can't always find all of that out, but a lot of it we can. Uh, we'll ask them what's changed in recent times, what's, what's new about their direction that really might make a difference in figuring out which buyers are, are good for us. We will talk to an average of probably 300 buyers for one seller to figure out who the right buyers are. After doing all that, we'll have a list of 30 that we think are just right, that we think fit really well. So it's worth all of that effort to figure out who those buyers might be and what those buyers might be willing to pay for the company. And the best buyers change constantly. Sellers come to us and over half the time they say, I know who's gonna buy me. Be one of these two or three guys. They're always wrong. <laughs> We've done it a long time. They're always wrong. I mean, it's never those two or three guys. Maybe they, the guy who was a great buyer last year has acquisition indigestion. That happens. It's a fact. Maybe there's new leadership, and that new leadership wants a new direction in the future of the company. Those things make a difference. We try to learn a lot of that as we talk through this process with the prospective buyers as we go, and it really helps. Um, competition. Is kind of the key. And we really work hard to make sure that that competition happens. Uh, we sold a company a few years ago. It's a nice size company, about 30 million. Had a really good footprint with its, its customers. Really strong. They all loved them. Uh, this company was 30 million in sales, but wasn't very profitable. They made about 1.5 million on 30 million in sales. But we got great competition. And when the competition got really tough, we ended up selling that company with 1.5 million in profits for 80 million cash. <laughs> it was amazing. It was wonderful. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> and you can do that if you manage that competition really well. Um, and it's worth the time. 
Now, in that first two months, say, we're doing that conversation with buyers, but we're also doing a lot of other things to help to get the information on the company in place. Um, we go through the technical details of the, the company. We need a lot of information that typically we don't have. Our, our clients have it. We get a lot of technical information from our client, put that together really well. We also research a lot of market and demographic information. We tend to be better at that than our clients are. It's a process of looking hard to see where the market is going and who's doing what and what the future looks like and what your competitive advantages are in that marketplace. So it's worthwhile. Um, we go through physical uh, inventory of what it's going to take to manufacture your goods. And we put together a lot of information on that for the, for the buyers. We go through what people skills are needed. What do you have in primary people skills and what do you need to grow to the next stage? It really helps. Um, we spend our first two months doing those kinds of things along with the, the buyer ID. And then we go through the, the competitive search. Uh, competition is really key. We sold a company uh, that where an owner came to us with a $20 million offer in hand. They said, we like it. It's not quite firm yet, but we're talking to them about $20 million and we'd like to accept it. But because they're not moving very fast, we want you to go ahead and take it and work on getting us other buyers. But we want you to exempt that buyer from any fees for you. Well, we, <laughs> we really can't do that, but... If you like the offer, accept the $20 million offer, go forward. If it closes, great. If it doesn't, come back and talk to us and we'll help. Well, these guys signed a letter of intent that gave them six months. Six months is really long in this business. So we, we don't give anybody more than 60 days, typically. And the buyer came back to them at the end of six months and said, oh, we don't quite have our, our stuff together yet. We need a little more financing, we need a little more due diligence. Can we have 90 days more? Well, our client said, okay, and gave them 90 days more. At the end of the 90 days more, they came to us and said, okay, we're ready now. <laughs> well, we started going out to sell the company, put together a package, started talking to buyers. And the original buyer came back to us and said, hey, no fair. We've done all this work. We spent all this time. And you're not, you're going to sell it without us? It's just not right. Well, in the meantime, we also learned that their original $20 million offer had been 80% note, 20% cash. We would never do that. We would never do that. So we said to the buyer, look, you're welcome to put in a proposal and we'll look at it. But two things. One, we think your price is low. Maybe not crazy low, but low. Um, and two, we're not going to look at any offer that's not 100% cash at close. So they came back, thought about it for about a week, and came back with an offer of $22 million cash at close and a $500,000 non-refundable deposit to show that their heart was in the right place. It worked. We got it closed, we were fine, everybody was happy. End of story. Um, we have another client right now, actually. This is a client that's kind of been difficult. They came to us, we did a lot of research on buyers, we were getting started, and they said, well, <clears throat> we only want you to talk to three buyers. We can't do that, <laughs> three buyers is nuts. It's really crazy, and we said, okay, we'll do that at the outset, but then if we're not getting it done, you have to open that door for us more. And they said, okay, we'll do that. Well, the first, their favorite buyer, the guy they really love, came to him with an offer of $16 million. That was way low. It, I mean, this company is not huge and profitable, but they are gonna be, I bet they'll be 300 million in five years. They're a really good company. So we told them no, they went away. Uh, they came back a little while later, a very short time, about four days later, they came back and raised it to 20 million. We said, we're getting closer, <laughs> but we're still not quite there. Well, they raised it to 25 million cash or close. Our client was happy and said, we're gonna take that. We were working on the LOI to get the terms worked out before we signed. And one of the other buyers came back and offered us 30 million. We kind of thought that was pretty exciting. Our fees, by the way, are based kind of oddly. They ratchet up. They're pretty low at a low end price, but then we get bonuses. And in this case, we were getting, we're in a 10% bonus level. So they raised it then to 35 million. So for us, that's a million. We like that. And our clients said, no, I really like those other guys. <laughs> so we signed with the other guys. It's not closed yet, but it, I think it will. But we want the client to be happy too. I mean, that's gotta be a, a part of it. And he feels like they're gonna be better for his people, better for his product long-term. So he's happy and we'll get it done. Uh, we sold a pet medical product last year. Um, we've done several pet deals over time. This one was kind of small. It was five million in sales. Most of our clients are 
10 plus, but five million in sales and kind of promising for the future. Um, we ended up with I guess, six or eight offers for that company that were a little under five million. We ended up with one that was 12 million. Cash at close. We took it, we closed it. <laughs> Done, happy ending. Good, good place to go. Um, as you go through this process, it's worth it to take a little time and effort and to torment over who those buyers might be. It really is a, a bit of time and effort, but it's really worth it. Um, and you can increase your, your potential so very much by doing that in a short time. There's a magnificent growth path in potential success. And in this industry, it's also kind of exciting that we're doing things that have healthy innovations that make a difference for people all over the world. So we like it, we find it exciting. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? I could to go first, I'm holding the mic. <laughs> you know, what strikes me about your line of work, I mean, it's self-evident, but it's all about the art of negotiation. That's true. And I guess quantity, you gave an example where they said, can you talk to these three people? And you're like, uh, I can, but why wouldn't you expose yourself to everyone who might be interested in you? Can you talk about that? Do they end up, do you end up typically going with one of those three because they had identified it ahead of time? No, it's, it's very rare. And we did in this case because our client especially loved the one buyer that came forth with the 16, then the 20, then the 25. They really liked them a lot and felt they'd be really great for their people. They, in the meantime, had become kind of annoyed with the $35 million guy. So it made them not want to take it. You talked about sometimes coming in too early in the process. Can you help us identify what's the ideal time to start thinking about it? I believe the uh, unfortunate story is a lot of people begin to think about, you know, maybe it's time that I begin to get out as they're on the decline. Can you that talk happens. about that? That is true, and that's, that's disastrous when that happens. The trend is more important than the numbers, in fact. Actually, the trend is very important. So you need to do it while you're on the climb. Also, most business owners who start and develop that early stage company aren't the same guys. They're gonna be great at managing it at a higher level. So it's really prudent to exit before you begin that tail downward. Maybe at the stage where you realize you need to do things that you don't know how to do. It's time to get help. It's time to get somebody else in there that can take it to the next stage. What's characteristic of a company that you can't get the deal done? What are the, what are the obstacles to closing? Because you're great at what you do. This is your livelihood. You can get a deal done, provided. Right. Um, the, there are very few deals that we haven't been able to get done. We've done 130. We've failed on four. So we have a really good track record. Of the four that we failed on, one guy had a stroke and was completely incapacitated for months. That was kind of unfortunate. One guy had a 90% customer concentration and the 90% customer was sold to somebody who owned a competitive division. Okay. Kiss of death. So odd things can happen to make it not succeed. But typically, if you work it very well and you work it very diligently and there's no huge trauma to the company, we can usually get it done. I'm thinking much like a recruiter hiring talent. Um, you know, a company might think, uh, I could go with them, they're an expert in what they do, but 35% is a lot. You know, I probably know someone in my network, so let me see if I can fill the job on my own. Well, um, I, I may have mis misled you somehow. No, no, I know about the, the steep, but okay. I mean, I, I recognize that. But I'm wondering, do you find in your role an obstacle from people choosing to adopt someone with your skill set because they're like, well, you know, if I could get $10 on my own, is she really going to get me $13 and I'm going to lose, lose the three, so I should just do it by myself and, you know, mitigate my risk? We find that if people are looking at professional investment bankers to help them sell, our competition is usually uh, structured the opposite of us. They use, everybody's heard of a Lehman formula, 5% on the first million, then 4%, 3 2 down to a, the reclining one. It's called what? Lehman. New to me. Brothers formula. It's Okay. It's well known in our industry, but our, ours actually goes the other way. For a typical $10 million seller, we'd be 3% to 10 million, 5% for the 10 to 12 piece, and 10% over 12. So it's going the opposite direction. Usually most sellers like that, because they, they know we have a strong incentive mm -hmm. to
get the best deal. Now, we have occasional guys like our guy right now who says, oh, I don't care how much it is. I like those guys. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> and sometimes that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, especially well, we'll if he's going to carry on. Wanna, do if there's no question from the audience. I'll, I'll uh, ask a, a final one, and that is uh, when you find yourself in that situation where there's uh, you know, kind of a predetermined buyer, uh, is there a role for you? Or it's like, hey, if you know the guy and you're going to do it, then what do you really need us for? Or how does well, that... you, you do worry about that, and we think about that. In this case, they really need us because they have a jerk of an attorney <laughs> who's made him mad and made him go away three times already. But the attorney's so... not watching. Don't worry. <laughs> so, so we can help okay. with that. Actually, I do have one more. Please okay. indulge me. Um, if we don't use um, Douglas Group or service like yours, what are the other options for people looking to sell their businesses. So, you know, what are the array of types of services and why would they consider going with you versus those competitive options to help you uh, liquidate your position? I think all of the the really viable competitors are gonna be full-time sellers of companies. Some of them sell and buy companies. We don't, we just sell. Um, You can look at both of those, but all of those are gonna be contingent success-based fees. You really need that because we will have commonly hundreds of thousands of dollars into a job before it's done. You don't want to have paid us that if we don't get it finished. Mm-hmm. Fair enough. So it works. Deborah Douglas, thank you very much.